I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about a subject that is really important in Washington and globally, we have with us Dr. Victor Cha, who is our Korea chair, and he's also our senior vice president for Asia programs. Victor has a brand new article in the January, February 2023 issue of Foreign Affairs called How to Stop Chinese Coercion, The Case for Collective Resilience. This is a really important thing that is circulating in in Washington. But before we even get to that, today we're talking on Friday, the North Koreans have apparently successfully tested an ICBM from the Sohei facility. Victor, I wanted to ask you about that first. What, what is, what's the significance of this? Yeah, Andrew, so it's great to be on the show with you. The significance of this is that they have tested what appears to be a very large solid propellant ICBM engine. So they didn't launch something into orbit, but they tested a very large engine and of an intercontinental ballistic missile that uses solid propellant. What they've tested thus far, the Hwasong-17, has been liquid-fueled. And solid-fueled propellant just makes it much harder for countries to try to preempt a launch because they don't need the time to fuel up the missile and and launch it. So um, we actually have a commercial satellite imagery piece coming out today. It was imagery from last week that showed that there was, in fact, a new horizontal test engine stand that we discovered uh, as a part of the construction they've been doing at the Sohei Satellite Facility. So in many ways, our piece sort of actually shows where they where they put this new test engine stand and where they did the test, test from. So this is a big deal. We're talking on Friday, December 16th. Last week, Beyond Parallel, our, our website and our project that you run, found these satellite images that showed real movement at the Sohei facility. And again, this is about a solid propellant, which means that it is much, much harder for the United States or any adversary to intercept a Korean ICBM, a North Korean ICBM, I should say. And North Korea has said that it has ICBMs that can hit anywhere in the continental U.S. So this is really a significant moment, isn't it? It appears to be pretty significant. They, I mean, for listeners, you know, who are not well versed in this, I mean, think about it this way, like you have a car, you have to put gas in your car. Um, If someone wanted to try to steal your car, they could do it during the time they see you putting gas in your car. But if you have a car that has solid fuel propellant, like you don't have to gas it up, it's much harder for that robber to grab your car while you're fueling it up because you can just start it and leave. That's the same thing with a solid fuel propellant ICBM. The United States can through satellite imagery see if they're fueling up an ICBM, you know, over the period of a day or so and could take it out if it needed to on the ground. But when you have solid fuel propellant, the only time you have is the time they have between putting it on a launcher and and firing it, uh, which is much less time than if they had to fuel the whole thing up. Yeah. So it's the difference between days and hours, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, as our satellite imagery and Beyond Peril has shown, they have established rail and other means to transport this kind of material onto the launch pad. And that's that's the really interesting thing for our listeners. And, you know, I should also say, Victor and I host the podcast, The Impossible State, where we talk about this, you know, almost every other week. The imagery on Beyond Parallel really shows the development at this facility and shows how dangerous it could now be if indeed they have a solid propellant ICBM engine. Yep, that's absolutely right. The combination of mobile launch capability and solid fuel propellant makes it that much harder for the United States or anybody else to take these things out on the ground before they put them into into the air. Of course, once they're in the air, we can track them and try to intercept them, but it's much easier trying to hit a stationary target on the ground than it is something that's hurtling through, you know, through the endo-atmosphere and the exo-atmosphere, the ability to do mobile launch capabilities and solid propellant makes it much harder for the U.S. All right. Well, we'll keep watching that. And again, you can see the satellite imagery on our Beyond Parallel micro website. Victor, let's switch gears to your foreign affairs article and talk about 
how the United States can and, and allies can stop Chinese economic coercion. We talk all the time about the Biden administration and the Congress dealing with supply chain issues with regard to China. What is the main thrust of this article you wrote and why is it so important for people on the NSC, people in Congress to really pay attention to? Yeah, so for your listeners, when we talk about Chinese economic coercion, you know, basically since 2008, China has economically coerced 16 countries and over 120 companies by basically weaponizing trade interdependence. So they use the power of their market, their ability to import things, their ability to send tourists abroad, their ability to send students abroad, their ability to take things off of websites. Uh, they use this as a, as a tool of coercion against countries and companies, often having to do with things like Taiwan or Hong Kong or Xinjiang, human rights, any of these sorts of issues. And it's a real problem. I mean, this this weaponization of interdependence, listeners may remember uh, just a few years ago when they sanctioned the NBA because one member of the management of the team retweeted uh, something in support of the democracy protesters in Hong Kong. And then China, with basically overnight, stopped streaming Houston Rockets games, took all Houston Rockets merchandise off off of online websites. You know, I mean, this is something that they they do. Now, there are more serious examples of this, which have to do with the potential for China through supply chains to cut off, you know, personal protective equipment or to cut off rare earth minerals as they did to Japan or any of these sorts of things. So the Biden administration has done a good thing in terms of combating this by raising the importance of this concept of economic security so that, you know, the supply chains are about economic security. They're not just about um, trade and economics. They've also focused on what's known as trade diversion, which is something we see a lot in Australia. China sanctioned the, you know, the crap out of Australia when Australia called for an independent investigation into the origins of COVID. And the Chinese then went after Australian beer, barley, beef, wine, all sorts of things. And China and Australia practiced trade diversion, which is that they simply started to sell these items to other importers rather than to the Chinese. And then the third has been what's been in the news a lot in terms of reshoring and friendshoring. That is sort of moving important supply chains out of China and into in, either back to the United States or to trusted countries, allies and partners around the world. Um, and then the last piece are export controls. We've seen this with the Biden administration announcing that they're going to uh, limit the export of sort of commanding heights technology and semiconductors to China in order to maintain a technological edge. So these four things, right, economic security, trade diversion, reshoring, friendshoring, export controls, are all ways of trying to deal with Chinese economic coercion. Um, but I, in this article, I offer another way to think about it. Okay, so tell us that, because, you know, last, last we heard the export controls, I think it was October 7th, the Biden administration announced it, you know, this was a really big deal. We're cutting China off from chips and really ramping up the chip wars in this sense. So what, tell us about your, your thoughts on your other way. Yeah. So, I mean, I think these are very important things to do. Like we want to maintain that technology edge over the peer competitor. And these are important things to do, but we can't do them alone. Like in, in the case of export controls on chips, we need the Japanese to do the same things. We need the Koreans the Taiwans and the Dutch, because these are sort of the major players in this particular area. However, their willingness to participate in these sorts of coalitional efforts is greatly dependent on how much they fear or do not fear Chinese economic retaliation, Chinese economic coercion. So the point of this article is that everything the Biden administration is doing is good, but it's it, and it's protecting certain supply chains, but it's not dealing with the core problem, which is how to stop the threat of Chinese economic coercion. If you can stop the threat of Chinese economic coercion, then all of these other partners are going to be more willing you know, to join like export controls on chips or to join supply chains because they're not worried that the Chinese are going to try to come after them you know, by sanctioning some other export of theirs to China or something 
of that matter. And so the name of the strategy that we talk about in this paper is called collective resilience, which is essentially to try to pull together countries in a coalition that would be willing to say to China, if you try to use economic coercion against any one of us, we will all respond in unison. So it's kind of like a collective economic deterrence. It's like an Article 5 for NATO, but for collective economic uh, deterrence against Chinese weaponization of interdependence. So it's, it's sort of the Trans-Pacific Partners formula. If we had simply been part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, some of this would already be in place, correct? We could have shaped it certainly in that direction if we were a part of it, but we're not a, we're yeah. not a part of it. You know, where we're seeing similar sort of thinking happening is in Europe, in the EU, where they are talking about so-called anti-coercion measures against China that were prompted by Chinese economic coercion against Lithuania. Um, so the Chinese are not just economically coercing countries in Asia, they're doing it also in Europe. And so it's this idea, again, of banding together. Any one of these countries in trying to deal with China on their own, they can't because China's just so big. Every country's trade you know, has asymmetries of trade with China. So they can't deal with China one-on-one -on -one if China sanctions them. But if we come together as a group, we have a much better chance of trying to deter Chinese economic coercion. And that was sort of the conclusion, back to the NBA analogy, the Houston Rockets can't take on China by themselves, but maybe the entire NBA can, because there's a lot of LeBron James jerseys that the Chinese want to sell and import. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it, it really is about, it's the same concept, right? It's about a collective effort to do this. And the important thing is that like, we're doing it in small groupings in terms of the supply chains and export controls because they're pinpointing certain key technologies. Right now it's export controls, but it could be biotech, it could be co quantum computing and all these things. And my, my point is that these are all good. We should do this. However, our chances of getting others to go along with us to participate in these export controls will be much higher if they don't fear Chinese economic retaliation, right? And so um, this strategy aims to do that. Now, just to give you a sense of the, the numbers, we at CSIS created this new and original data. As I said earlier, Andrew, China has economically coerced 16 countries since 2008. If you look at the terms of trade of those 16 countries with China, those 16 countries export over 400 items to China that China is highly dependent on. By highly dependent, we mean more than 70% dependent. So let's say Lithuania, which China has sanctioned because Lithuania said something on human rights. If China sanctioned uh, Lithuania, you know, with regard to they're no longer going to import, you know, apples from Lithuania to try to punish Lithuania for its statements on economic coercion. Our analysis shows that you know, Lithuania exports to China another item, like widgets or something, that China is highly dependent on, that they get most of their widgets from Lithuania, like more than 70% dependent. And so our point is that there are over 400 items that China is up to 70% dependent on, worth over $30 billion in trade to China. So... Alone, these countries can't deal with Chinese economic coercion. But as a group, right, as a group, if they all come together and say, look, if you continue to do this against any one of us, we have this capacity, we have this leverage to sanction items that are very important to you. And that would force you to have to try to find substitutes and all other things. That is probably a proposition that China doesn't want to doesn't want to deal with. And so just to give a sense of why we say 70% dependence is that everybody knows that, or many people know that China is dependent on Australian iron ore, right? So in all the sanctioning they've done of Australia, they won't touch iron ore. China is only 56% dependent on Australian iron ore, right? Only 56%. So we're talking about over 400 items that China is more than 70% dependent. In some cases, 100% percent dependent on these very countries that they're economically coercing, right? And so the idea behind collective resilience is, you know, any one of those countries, you know, might threaten to do this themselves, but it won't mean anything 
But as a group, it could really create enough of an obstacle or a headache for China that it might deter them from trying to economically coerce these countries. You know, we've talked a lot about over the last couple of years, the United States is dependent on China for PPE. The United States is dependent to some extent on China for things like ingredients that goes into our medicines. There's half a dozen other examples I could cite. Is this a problem for us if we go it alone? So, I mean, this is, yes, we're dependent on China for many things, but this is what the whole notion of uh, supply chain resilience is about. We, you know, we are trying to find sort of the critical items that we cannot afford to be dependent on China for, intermediate products, finished products that we cannot afford to be dependent on China for, and trying to protect those supply chains, you know, by working with other countries, Japan, Korea, Australia, Mexico, Canada, others, to try to uh, insulate and protect those supply chains, which is a good thing. We should continue to do that. The problem is we can't do that for everything. Like everybody knows you cannot completely economically decouple from China, right? And because you can't completely economically decouple from China, China is going to try to use that leverage to try to economically coerce the weakest member of a coalition, right? They're going to try to peel off members of any coalition we put together on economics or security by using the leverage, you know, the leverage of their large market. And so that's why this collective resilience strategy is aimed at trying to acknowledge that we cannot economically decouple from China, but at the same time, try to present a united front that will deter them from using their market as a weapon against countries. So what are the political obstacles to forming this kind of group that we're talking about? So there are lots of political obstacles. If you think about trying to put together any group of countries that with a particular purpose, you have to first get that political commitment that they're willing to stand with you. You have to also have the domestic politics of the country support such an action because it could mean that you would have to threaten counter coercion against China, even if they're not attacking you, right? If they're attacking another member of the coalition, the whole idea behind collective deterrence, collective resilience is that all members of the coalition would have to say an attack against one of us is a, an attack against all of us. Yeah, right? just like and, NATO. Just like NATO. So, and politically, that's much harder to do in today's day and age because, you know, countries are very self-help. They're like, why should I do that? If, they're, if China's not attacking me, why should, I, why should I risk more Chinese economic sanctions by protecting Lithuania? or protecting Palau, another, you know, another place that they have economically coerced. So you know, there is a collective action free rider problem. At the same time, though, I think everybody understands that no one wants to live under the shadow of Chinese economic coercion. No country, no company you know, wants to live under this shadow forever, because China will continue to do this forever unless someone tries to stop it. The point in this article is we have the data to show that these countries, these are just the 16 countries. If we start adding the EU in, the numbers get much larger. These 16 countries, you know, they have leverage on China because they export things to China that China is highly dependent on. Like the United States, for example, has up to 94 items that it exports to China that China is more than 70% dependent on, totaling, you know, over $6 billion. Japan has by far the most. Japan has over 100 items that it exports to China, that China is greater than 70% or greater dependent on. What are some of those items, you know, the 94 items the United States exports to China that they're more than 70% dependent on? What's, a, what's an example of something like that? So I don't have the whole list data in front of me, but they range. They, they range from things like, if I remember correctly, they they range from things like Kentucky bluegrass seed, right, uh, of which there's something like, I think it's like over 90% dependent on, to other sort of precursor materials and intermediate materials. I mean, it's a wide range of things, admittedly, some of which are substitutable, some of which aren't. They're, like, for example, they are nearly 100% dependent on Japan for ballpoint pens, <laughs> um, for uh, you know, for the, it, but the you know these lists are really long, and and you know we you have to, you have to go through them and see for which of these are there easily substitutable items. 
But even if there are, the notion that China would want to deal with this every time, you know, that right now they see they have no cost when they economically coerce somebody. Like they they decided to stop importing Philippine bananas because of a dispute, a territorial dispute in the South China Sea. There is there's huge pain to the Philippines, little economic cost to the Chinese government because they don't really care if the Chinese people are upset about that, right? I mean, it's because it's not a democracy, right? They can just do that. But if we can at least make them think that there's a cost for doing that, that they will then have to find substitutes for 400 items that they normally rely on these countries for, it creates a deterrent effect, right? So when I present to this, people say, oh, you're advocating for a trade war. I'm not advocating for a trade war. I'm advocating for deterrence. Right. The whole idea is that a successful deterrence strategy means you don't have to use the threat. It's just like in security, like successful security deterrence is when you don't have to go to military action. It's just the threat of the action that will deter and that will keep the peace. So it's the same concept with regard to collective economic deterrence. And nobody has sort of looked at this data and pulled together that, in fact, wow, all these countries do have leverage that we weren't aware of before. So going forward, the United States has a lot of work to do to line up this coalition. What are some of the things that the Biden administration are going to need to do to get this kind of thing done? Yeah, so I think one of them is, there are a couple of things. One is basically socializing everybody to the fact that, you know, Chinese economic coercion is here to stay. And I don't think that's hard to do. I think everybody understands that Every country in the world walks around on eggshells when it comes to saying something about China because they worry that they're going to be economically coerced. Every country, every company worries about that. So that's one element. Then the other is to continue to map the data that we've collected to include like the European Union and to include others to see what other high dependence items there are out there that provide leverage. And then the third is whether it's in the context of IPEF or some other gathering, bringing the countries together and talking about this concept as something that only works if we all do it together. It does not work if the United States does it itself. It does not work if the United States and Japan do it themselves. It requires you know, all these countries to be in this uh, together, right? Like the three musketeers, one for all and all for one. We can't do it without Australia and Korea. There's no way. No, we can't do it without Australia and, and certainly without Australia, Japan, and Korea. And again, you know, some skeptics might say, well, you know, still like China's economy is huge, it's like trillions and trillions of dollars. You're talking about tens of billions of dollars. Why should it bother them? If you look at total exports to China from the United States, Japan, Korea, and Australia alone, it's almost 40%. Of China's total imports, right? So that's substantial. Yeah, it's a significant economic chunk that China has to deal with. It's a lot of ballpoint pens. A lot of ballpoint pens. A lot of Kentucky bluegrass seed. A lot. Of, yeah. A lot of cardboard. A lot of and, and you know I'm I'm just we're making light of it, but there are many other things like the lists, as you can imagine, are very long. Well, that's that's the thing is people don't realize that you know ballpoint pens. We are making light of it, but like when you start looking at the lists of all these things. And 40 percent, it's a significant and a substantial hit to China if that's going to be the case. Yeah. And um, again, I, I apologize to listeners because I don't have all the data right in front of me. But th for example, China gets like nearly 100 percent of their Scotch whiskey from the UK. Right. Mm -hmm. So so these are significant. You know, these are some of them are luxury items. Some of them are staple goods. Right. Some of them are intermediary products. But, you know, China doesn't want to deal with this when they're dealing with, like, all the chaos domestically over the COVID lockdown, the war in Ukraine, Taiwan Straits. I mean, the, the whole point of that is that if you can put together this credible coalition, we can neutralize China's ability to use economic coercion at their, at their will, whenever they feel like doing it, and raise the cost, potential cost for them to do that. And if we succeed in doing that, it's going to be much easier for the Biden administration to lead these coalitions on export controls, on supply chains, on friendshoring and reshoring. So it's meant to complement 
the current administration strategy, not to undermine it. And, you know, everybody knows this, like in Congress, they're trying to think of a strategy for how to stop Chinese economic coercion. In the White House, you know, their, their strategy guys are trying to figure out, like, what's a strategy we can come up with to try to stop Chinese economic coercion? Because they know if they can reduce that threat, it's much easier to say countries, hey, join our export controls on quantum computing, join our export controls on commanding heights technology in, in whatever the area might be to maintain the competitive advantage. Well, Victor, this is all fascinating. And again, the article is in Foreign Affairs, January, February issue. I know that it's going to be a reference point for a long time on this set of issues. So thanks very much for giving us a sense of what you've come up with here. Thanks, Andrew. It's an honor to be on Truth of the Matter. (laughs) We'll see you on Impossible State very soon. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 